Wonderful. Well, again, welcome to uh, the Open We Stand weekly virtual meetups. I just, I love these meetups. They're just great visibility and perspective and what people are doing across the globe. Um, and we've had people from all walks of life. You know, we've had advisors, we've had small business owners, we've had people that run events like Manny here that have shifted completely to virtual. Um, and I'm excited today because I got my buddy Christian on today and Christian and I have known each other for a very long time, about 14 or 15 years. Yep. And uh, <laughs> I've just loved watching his journey. Um, you guys will get to learn a little bit more about Christian once we get started, but his journey is exciting because he went from servicing small businesses and moving into major accounts with ADP, he moved to Germany and started working there. Um, and then he got into the AI world, which was a little bit wild and cool to watch him step into that. And now he works for a company that's, you know, big on connection and simplifying their journey uh, over at LeapWork. And then uh, I think he and his wife have some fun stuff going on too. So, you know, it, it's just exciting to hear from people like Christian. It's exciting to, to hear these stories and these opportunities to see the global perspective because we're all in our little bubble, right? So, Christian, thanks for being here today. I'm going to have everybody on the call introduce themselves first so that people know some of the community members that are here. And then I'm going to let you kind of introduce yourself, if that's all right. Sure. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let uh, Rachel go first, then Jonathan, and, and then Manny, if that's all right. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel McCool from GoDaddy, I'm one of the community managers. And I actually manage uh, community programs and thrilled to be here. Thank you, Adam. And Christian, I can't wait to hear your story. So thanks for thanks for being here with us. No problem. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Graziano. I work on the social media team, uh, the GoDaddy social media team uh, as an engagement manager. So uh, I work on our LinkedIn channel and I do a lot um, to help sort of facilitate conversations and to um, build to, to, to uh, along the lines of what Rachel does to help build um, communities uh, within GoDaddy. And I'm super excited. We've had a really, it's been a really awesome month of these. And I'm, I can only imagine that this is going to be an equally incredible way to round out the month. So I'm really excited to have you uh, to chat with us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Hey, I'm Manny Larcher. I'm the founder of Stopwatch Creative. We're a marketing agency uh, with clients around the world. And we also incubate products like Collaborate and Elevate, um, which is a SaaS platform that we're connecting others to opportunities. And I, I was a past guest and I um, always enjoy catching up with Adam and uh, tapping into the community. And uh, just excited to, to learn more about you, Christian. And uh, thank you. Awesome. Well, my name is Adam Griggs. I am the co-founder and creator of Clarify. I'm your moderator today. And I am excited to introduce you guys to Christian Rag. Well, thanks. Um, I, I th it was a very, very uh, um, flattering introduction, Adam. So I appreciate that. Um, sounds much grander than it actually is, probably in real life, you know. But um, yeah, happy to happy to be here and share a little bit about the journey because it, at least it is it shows a lot of facets, right? Um, so Christian Reich is my name. Currently, I work for LeapWork, which is a no-code software automation company. So we basically automate everything that is currently repetitive, mundane, um, uh, in, in everybody's work life, actually, right? Um, uh, and so people can really focus on what really matters, kind of removing the mundane and, you know, getting back to ideation, innovation and all that stuff. Um, the journey started somewhere else, though, about 15, 20 years ago. I mean, Adam, you and I, we met, we met in Tucson, Arizona. Um, but you might guess it, I'm not American, actually. I'm a German. Um, I met my wife in college in, in Germany and decided that um, love is bigger than, uh, than country, so to say. And I followed her to Tucson where I finished studies and um, got my feet wet there with some you know, small business sales. I started out in, um, well, we met uh, in the sports industry, right? But I moved away from that and into kind of the HR world with payroll and all that. Um, and so, and that's where I got like my feet wet and kind of figuring out, okay, how can we, we help business owners just make their lives easier, right? And that's have kind of stuck with me because whether it's HR or, or, or insurance or marketing, whatever it is, I think most of our primary goal is, you know, to help somebody make their lives a little bit better. Um, and as long as you keep that in the forefront and keep the care about the other person in the forefront, I, I think you're 
you can do whatever the industry is and whatever the technology is, you can, you can do some good. Um, it might not be, you know, you might not be saving lives or whatever it is, but um, it's the little things that count, right? Every every moment that you, that you can, you know, make a change in somebody's life. So um, I made payroll sound very, very grand right now, which maybe it isn't, but uh, so moved into payroll, right? Um, quickly realized though that, um, that I do enjoy very complex situations, you know, and I, I, I can step a little bit outside the small business world and that with, uh, you know, my approach and where to handle where I think I was uh, very good at handling very large uh, accounts. So I, I moved to ADP, which was still is the leader in HR technology, I think, and, and payroll. Um, and, um, you know, helped larger corporations like 500,000 employees and so, such and such. And an opportunity in Germany came up um, and I figured, you know, raising the kids, I have a wife and two kids, 13 um, year old son now, almost 11 year old daughter. So back then they were still preschool age. And I figured, you know what, raising them in Germany, multicultural, two languages, my homeland, why not give it a try? So um, this is actually really interesting. You might find this funny. The opportunity came up in March of 2014 and the fiscal year at ADP started in July of 2014. So March, we made the decision. Um, April, beginning of May, we sold the house, sold everything we have. And by June, I was in Germany and we completely uprooted ourselves and moved over. So that was the second time in 10 years that I switch continents basically. Um, but it went really great, you know, it was a, it was a fantastic time. Um, uh, but then the time, time comes, you know, when my wife and I, we love to love the world, we love to travel. And four years in Germany really, I say Germans are not known for being the most like open, hearted, fun, loving people. <laughs> and there is something to it, you know, we're very rigorous uh, uh, people and, um, uh, it was time for a more, um, maybe a, Britain is more of a mix between Germany and America, right? It's a, it's a healthy mix between um, a more open culture like America and a, a more European safety net kind of uh, environment. And so we actually also very quickly decided um, last year, despite everything that's going on, um, a good opportunity came up in the AI space and um, yeah, we hopped over on this little island and have pretty much been in lockdown since then, right? Um, but uh, another reason for this move was uh, we also decided to pull our kids out of school and they're being uh, completely homeschooled now, which was not doable in, in Germany um, because we believe, and this is actually, we might pick this argument string up in a minute, that through what I've learned over the past 15 years, you know, I've, I've come to know that our school system and the way we educate is not really designed for the entrepreneur of the future, right? Um, the Nothing that I know today was ever taught to me in school, right? It was all done either on the streets, through conversations, through intelligence, you know, applied knowledge, learning as, as you do. Um, and I think we're missing the mark a lot with the way we teach our children. So we pulled out our kids. My son's 13. He learns to code Python now. He, he programs video games. Um, and uh, those things he wouldn't have learned until 10 years down the road, probably, right? So we're trying to kind of accelerate their journey into, into entrepreneurship. And um, we we'll hope it works, you know, it's a big investment. Uh, um, but OK, that was me, five minute rundown. Um, uh, I don't know how you run this. Happy to jump in with questions, right? Because I don't know where you want to take this conversation. Oh, that, that was that was awesome. It, it, that was a really good high-level story of you as a person kind of moving through life and evolving. And you know what I think is funny is you brought up the fact that you had different perspectives that you shifted on. Like you were in small business and then you went to majors. And those are kind of opposite sides of the fence. You had kids in school and then you decided to unschool mm -hmm. them. And those are si opposite sides of the fence. And perspective matters in life, right? Perspective matters yeah. in the world. And you're in the UK, which is completely locked down right now. And we're in the US, which is basically open, you know, we're, we're taking yeah. precautions, but most of it's open. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just interesting to have these dialogues and these conversations yeah. perspective. And just for everybody's kind of overview here, Christian and I, when we started this journey 15 years ago, we were, we were working in the fitness industry 
and we butted heads like we we disagreed on some stuff right we did yeah and it's okay to have differing opinions because that's what brings us to growth and, and evolution and adaptation to technology and the way we school the way we communicate the way that we tell business owners how life can go right they yeah. see you and they're like man may, maybe maybe i want to keep pursuing my little my little hole in the wall area that i'm looking through or maybe i want to break through and see what's on the other side right and that's that's kind of what you've done i love it i love it yeah i i think one thank you for saying this one thing that my wife and i were always very proud of is um when there's a door open we'll walk through it right um and we've always applied um a very calculated method method of assessing the risk, right, of an of a of a decision. Because I, I saw this a lot, and whether it's a small business, medium sized business, or even large corporations. Now I work with large corporations, um, you know, like the Fortune 100s, and but but the decision makers are still, you know, they control their own budget and their own little teams and all that stuff. So. Um, they, they're still of this mindset that they're often very afraid to make decisions, right? Because what, what if it goes wrong and all that stuff? And so we always applied like, what's the worst possible outcome that you can live with, right? And that's a very, very effective strategy to deciding whether you can live with this. If we had, you know, we moved from, from the US to Germany, what would a, the worst possible outcome have been is we get there maybe and after three months I lose my job as an example, right? Or after three months, I can't even think of a worse scenario than this. And then we're like, okay, what if I were to lose my job? Well, in Germany, there's job security, right? And, and I'm like always able to find a find a new job. So I'm like, there's no way I'm ever out of the job for more than a month. So lowest possible risk, not a problem. We'll go for it. Um, we moved here to the UK. We figured what's the what's the biggest possible risk uh, actually, we couldn't think of one that was worse than losing a job, which is kind of sad, but um, maybe get into a car accident driving on the other side of the road, by the way, that was also a, a big change. Um, but we couldn't find one we couldn't live with, right? And if you if you take decision making in this manner, you're never disappointed or you never, you know, at fear to take the decision because you already eliminated what's the worst thing that can happen, right? Um, and the other flip side of the coin is, of course, to look at the at the enormous potential that that comes with this and we've always been people to more see more of the potential than like okay, if i can live with the risk what's the upside of it and then just go for the upside um there's actually as i don't know if this is fits but uh, i love there's a speech on youtube from Arnold schwarzenegger and i i don't know if you've seen it adam but it, it stuck with me over the past 10 years and you know politics aside and movies aside it's um this his philosophy was was very interesting because people always asked him like well you've you're bodybuilder and then actor and then and then politician you know the crazy journey like what was your plan b if that had failed and he said i don't have plan b's right and that's many people live their lives with plan b's and plan c's if this doesn't work i'm gonna do this but the challenge that comes with this you have to invest brain power in plan b and plan c and you mentally have written off a big portion of your of your plan A already, right? So um, I don't have plan Bs most of the time. I invest fully and I make the decision based on on the worst possible outcome. And once the decision is made, it's all in. And uh, it's it's a very it's very gratifying, right? Yeah. So that that explains a lot on your journey. Go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> I was just going to say that is such a practical approach to life. Um, I I also have very much a, a thing about when doors are open, you have to recognize that a door is open and, and take risks. And I think, uh, you know, I'm very similar to how you just described yourself. Like I like to look at all aspects of what, you know, could happen and then just go for it. And, you know, the, Sometimes the plan B stuff, um, it, it all depends on how you are and, and how you think and work. But, you know, some people like to have a backup plan. Yeah. Um, but again, if you've calculated to all of the, the possibilities and then you're just like, I want to do this, like, great. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes as you 
do something new, you come across things that maybe you didn't think about, but that's the adventure in life. Yeah. Like, otherwise it would be boring. Life is all about experience. And I just, it's one of the crazy things because like 15 years ago, we didn't have the visibility that we got because of Facebook and, and WhatsApp and, and just social media in general. And watching your journey has just been fulfilling. Even watching you evolve on LinkedIn as a professional, it's exciting and encouraging because a lot of us do get pigeonholed into what we think we have to do because we're so afraid to move or pioneer or do something different. And I love that you just put that out there. Just <laughs> look at the worst, worst thing that can happen. And if you can live with it, do it. I mean, that's, that's powerful. It's funny. I'm a, you know that I'm a journalism major too. I, I didn't even study this. So. <laughs> I wanted to jump in really quick because what I, what, I, excuse me, what I think is so interesting about that and as someone who does who has struggled a lot with coming up with okay what's my plan a what's my plan b and realizing that not only does that already lead to indecisiveness right if i know there's a plan b then i yep. might i might feel like i don't have to give a hundred percent to That's this it. plan a because i do know i have something to fall back to um, or, you know, hypothetically, I will have something to fall back to that's safer or something that I feel is more attainable. Um, mm -hmm. But I also like how you phrase it with, can you live with it? Because there were a lot of people who I feel like, in, especially in the work that we, I do in particular with talking with so many people who are just either just launching their business or they're helping others to launch their mm -hmm. business. You realize that they got to the point where they realize I cannot live with my plan B. And a lot of people think this you know, the, the job that takes care of, you know, takes care of the bills, take care of the family, it's all super important, but that could still very well be the plan B. And you see so many people in that position who are successful, but they are not living, right? They're, yeah. they're not living that goal. And, and it, it's, it's been very interesting to listen to that really full on committed perspective to, to, your, to your plan A, because I think that's, that's just, that's what you got to do, right? That's the leap. That's the thing. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's really cool to hear that, hear that from you and knowing how that relates to Fortune 100 companies all the way down to, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm done with Etsy. I'm ready to launch my own store. Like, yeah. it, you know, it's interesting to see how that all ladders down. And, and you said it correctly, right? It's the, you give yourself an out. And once you have an out, you know, you don't have to be committed, right? If there's no other option, you will come up with solutions to make it work, right? Then your plan A actually evolves and that's the goal, you know, and don't, the plan A is not always going to be the same plan A. Plan A is an evolution of your roadmap and your strategy and all that stuff. And you work on it and you change it and all that stuff. Um, I think like having too many options and like, like you said, it, it, it just leads to indecisiveness is probably the right word, like you said. Um, and it, it also leads to a lot of inaction, right? Um, if you have only one way, one way to go, you have to act. And I think a lot of people, they just, they question themselves, right? They say, ah, oh, what if I, but what if I had done that? And, and, oh, I can't do this because, you know, I have to pay the bills this month. I mean, those are tough decisions to make, um, but there will always be another tough, tough decision next month. And if you every month find another tough decision to make and another tough reason not to do something, you'll, you'll never do something. Sometimes you just have to take the leap. And, um, and more times than not, it's, it's just the same outcome, right? Um, yeah. Hey, you guys will, will love, my father used to say to me, I can remember way back when I was little that there was no such word as can't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like as a little kid, like that just, that was like, what? Um, but it really kind of, it's, it has definitely stuck with me um, through the years and stuff. And, you know, they're, there has been times that I have said, I can't do something. Um, and then maybe I've come up with a way to, to get it done. So mm -hmm. it's like the Yoda proverb, right? Mm -hmm. I knew you're going to bring it up. You're also a Star Wars nerd. That's what that was a I really am. good Yoda. That is, <laughs> there's, there's years of practice behind that Yoda. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There is. okay. Let's, let's hear Grogu right now, Adam. <laughs> Does he even make a sound? I don't even know. <laughs> oh. Funny. No, that's awesome. I, I, I love the story and I love, I love that you're sharing your life with us. And, and I feel like people resonate with what you're saying. You know, I, I work with a group of, of advisors, they're financial advisors, and they start with what's called 
the finishing line, right? And the finish line to them isn't retirement. It's what's the worst that can happen. And mm-hmm. we're going to reverse engineer it and make the best that can happen. And then we'll be prepared for everything, which is, it's powerful. And I think having that level of, of trust is powerful. And then what you do now and evolving in, in technology and connection and making things easier so that people can have meaningful conversations that brings about conviction and decisions also, right? People that want to challenge the status quo or change the world or, or make themselves more accessible to their kids, homeschooling them, or maybe you want to be more accessible and reachable to, to, to small business owners, or, or you want to work with the Fortune 100 because you want to understand how they think. I think allowing yourself to have that inner dialogue that you don't have a plan B is cool. I think having the community that backs the trust in that conviction and that decision is so much more powerful. I, I just, I just, I love that. So I'd love to hear, I mean, a little bit about kind of your tribe. Do you have a community that helps support you? You're talking to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is with Zoom, you can't see where somebody's looking. I'm like, is he looking at me? No, just, I'm joking. Um, so what's, what's really important is um, a few things. Um, naturally, with tribe, the first thing that comes in mind is, of course, my wife, right? We are, um, dynamic duo is probably like a very overused phrase, but we make every decision together and we, well, we hold each other by the hand and we jump into the water together, right? So it is, I think it's important, whether it's a mentor or whether it's a business partner or, or, or business advisor, you do need somebody to make sure that the leap is not complete insanity, right? Um, and it needs to be like a mental sparring partner where you can bounce off ideas. Um, so I always have her, of course, as a backup. But in business as well, uh, I well, I was fortunate enough for for many of my years to work with very in very large organizations too. You know, uh, six hundred thousand employee companies and all that stuff. So there's a big network of very experienced people. And I've always picked out some senior managers. You know, just bounce off like doing the right thing here. How do you see this? And most of the time, somebody with 10, 15 years down the road of experience, um, you can learn from some of the mistakes they made, right? So I think having a network of just, yeah, people to keep you in check and to bounce ideas off is not, um, is certainly advantageous. Um, is it necessary in, you know, to make decisions and to move forward, especially right now when we're all on lockdown and isolated? Um, um, yeah, no, I was going to say maybe, maybe not. But now that I think about it, uh, yes, it is. And I think we have, well, this is the perfect example actually here, right? Which, which, what you're organizing here. Um, I think um, 20 years ago, this kind of political and, 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 you know, health crisis, whatever it is, I don't know how people would have coped with it, right? But now having Zoom and having, you know, all these possibilities and me, I work from home completely, right? I don't even have to, I used to travel a lot, but now I work with clients in Austria and Switzerland and all across Germany and then the UK um, like this, right? And you can build communities, you can reach out to people, um, you can build relationships with, because you see in, like, I have customers they're CEOs and CTOs of companies I can see into the bedroom sometimes you know um, actually I'll give you a funny story this might be interesting um, not quite related to the tribe but more related to the how personal we are getting now um, which uh, Germans when I moved to Germany first it was suit and tie in every meeting right you didn't put a tie on you got looked at sideways you know uh, it was very formal, very official. So that's how I was brought up my first five, six years back here in Germany in business. Um, so Zoom comes, COVID comes and all that. And we moved to completely, is camera on, camera off? I don't know. Um, anyway, so somebody sets a meeting for me with the CEO of a German, a large German engineering company, right? I'm like, oh, engineering company, the CEO. I realized 10 minutes before that it's a video invite. I'm like, wow, I don't even have a shirt on. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to iron my shirt. I iron my shirt real fast. I put a tie on. I put my suit on. I got all ready, all, all frantic. I turn on the camera. I get all proper. And the guy comes on the hoodie, right? I'm like, oh, Chris, you're such a fool. <laughs> he, would, he actually just meant to have a, like a personal business conversation. And I kind of looked out of place. So 
long story short is I think we're in a very unique situation to actually, despite the distance, right, to build different relationships that are not possible before. But before you met in boardrooms, you met in meetings, you met somewhere else, and there was always kind of like this, here's a chair, there's a desk, there's a chair, there's a presentation, there's a whiteboard. Now it's like, hey, Adam, cool, what's that picture back there, right? What does that mean? Um, are you a sailor or, you know, I see you have, you know, you, your children back there. So it's, um, you get a very unique look into people's lives. So um, yeah, that was a long answer, right? But uh, sometimes that the answers is, develop as you speak. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. That is so interesting. You know, it's it's really funny just to share with you, Christian, that I, I worked for eBay for a number of years and um, yeah. we had a large presence in Germany. And so because we were a tech company, people weren't formal like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I never, I never experienced the formality that you're talking about, but it's, it comes down to um, with the, the situation that we're in now of like, how comfortable are you being you, um, but still being professional, right? And, yeah. um, but I, I would have probably done the same thing that you did with a, a CEO yeah. of a, a company, like you're want to feel like you're going to button yeah. down as you go into the call. So I bet you it was probably really cool talking to him. Um, just like being in a hoodie. And he stuff. was, an, he was interesting. He was an interestingly enough, I found out later that uh, he was 39 years old. So a very young CEO, you know, and he was trying to, he said, the first thing he said was my goal is to unstuff this company, right? He said, everybody's so stuffy here. So he just happened to be a very forward thinking guy. Um, and that's the one I kind of polished up for, but uh, we had a good laugh about it. <laughs> but you said it right, right? It's the, it's the you being you. I think I don't know if there's also a generational thing, um, uh, but there's there's you know especially with social media, LinkedIn and and everything else gets more merged with other social media, and you feel it all, kind of becoming a bigger blend and. Um, I want to say about 20 years ago, maybe the corporate identity was a lot more important. And now it's the personal brand becomes more important. Who are you as a person, right? Um, because, you know, I don't know if, if my customers care too much what Libreworks stands for, or if they care more about, you know, what, what, I, what I stand for, you know, they want to get to know me and how I operate. And it's good that Libreworks is a fantastic company that has you know, that has a, a lot of smart people that are very forward thinking, but, um, you know, my customer cares about, I think, the personal relationship more than they would have probably 20 or 30 years ago, I would say. I yeah. actually have to disagree with you because oh, please um, do, yeah. I've been around in business a long time and it's been really interesting. I've been in different industries um, and I think the personal relationship is and has been a very big key to retaining customers. And I remember like in an industry that I was in uh, quite a long time ago, um, the one, the one uh, company I worked for closed and I actually moved over a bunch of my clients because of my relationship with them. And they nice. just trusted that I would take care of them in the new company as well. And so, you know, people just want that connection. That's super important. Yeah, that's and a good point. And you are, you are kind of the face of leap work for them, right? Like, so however you act and, and Jonathan and I know this, right? Because we're a representative of GoDaddy, the same type of thing. So mm -hmm. if, if Jonathan and I are friendly and open and caring, you know, people are maybe associate that that's like the way GoDaddy yeah. is. And by the way, it is because uh, we work with a lot of really great people. But if we were jerks, you know, and said yeah. things that people were like, hmm, they might sit there and go, oh, that that represents the company that we work for. So it's, yeah. it is really kind of interesting. I think I think it's very interesting. Rachel's point, I think it's interesting because I also I'm, and there's also just something that from working in specifically in social media like engagement, there are a lot of brands who go that way. Right. And their whole to, like. Um, I worked at a company called Vayner Media for a while. I worked under Gary. You did yeah. I was I was going to mention yeah, Gary actually TV. earlier. Oh really? Are you kidding? Action thing, this whole action thing. You know, I I I watch 
every day at least one gay video. It's, it's yeah, I just need it. Is, day, you know? And he is that way. Like he is that way. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that we did is one of our old clients we worked on, we had this whole engagement strategy where it was, it was a it was for teenagers, uh-huh. like it was for teenagers and young 20 somethings. And what we did is we have them nominate, they tag someone on a on a piece of content, and then we'd make a joke about them. So one of the whole, the one of the brand tent poles was that if people came to us on social, they knew that they could get made fun of, or they knew that they could get dragged for some of the things that they said. Mm-hmm. And although it didn't speak to, you know, obviously I think like rudeness and meanness has, you know, it, it is is a is a difficult thing to salvage. But when you can when you can make that kind of when you can make that kind of thing witty, or you can make it really represent the kind of brand that you are and that speaks with your customer i think it can, i think it, it's it's one of those nuanced things that i don't think that would work for godaddy simply because of what we're what we're selling and what people need from us right there's right it, this is not like a you know some you know some packaged good this is a this is a real dream that people purchase from us but if we're like a little you know an iced tea company or something it's like yeah we can totally drag you and that's going to appeal to all of these people who play you know who who either you know drink this product while they're playing video games or whatever it might be like it really is just so much about who is this audience and will they know that this is all in good fun you know something like that yeah yeah Yeah, i think it's important to be in the right place in the right environment too You, you spoke earlier christian about things being more blended and you're kind of the persona but you're also on social media for your personal, you know, relationships, maybe even your personal brand, you're on LinkedIn and some of these things are dripping and crossing over. So it's, it's important to know what, where, and how we're allowed to be like that. And it is, I think a lot of times it works in your favor. Like Jonathan said, it can be very disarming so that you can have open conversation, even if we disagree. Like if, if you want to have a conversation on why homeschooling or you know, private Mm -hmm. schooling or public schooling needs to evolve and adapt. We need to have those conversations and we have to do it professionally, but we have to also do it in in a disarming manner. So we all know we're human. So sometimes people crack jokes and they've got to be right. You know, they've got to be in in the right audience at the right time. So I, uh, I appreciate you saying that. I think the, uh, the blended realm is, is real and it affects us all. Yeah, the other thing I, I have definitely, since I've been doing community for a long time, online community for a long time, is that what people write sometimes is not conveyed in the same way as how they would actually say it. And so people get into a lot of trouble in how they write things. Um, and the tone, the, the tone behind it does not come through. And uh, I, have, I have many times in the last 20 years doing community had people say just the most either ridiculous or outrageous things. And I've sometimes picked the, the phone up to call them and they're completely different people like talking to them in person. And that's something that with social, I think now there's a lot of people that don't really realize that. And then there's just a lot of people that aren't good writers. <laughs> and so, you know, they may say something that it's like, they don't really intend it to come off like that, but they worded it improperly and people took them. Yeah that way uh, you actually make a good point something that i i had ex- struggled with even though i didn't expect to struggle with it was uh, the cultural differences you know living in the i lived in the U, as a german in the u.s for 10 years and and became almost naturalized i would say right um and then coming home to germany i did have a culture shock about you know how, how different and and closed uh, the people were right um and it's just like different words that different cultures use um different mannerisms different um rituals that they have in, in their daily lives um i think they get amplified now that we have a global workforce you know before maybe 100 years ago you only would sell to your people that came into your store and then it expands and expands and now you can do business with almost anything all over the globe if you have the right type of business you know not of course if you're a, a little plumber or so more difficult but you still have to be looking out for those nuances you know and understanding how people mean something if you have an example about that um and i i stumbled upon this somebody wrote me in my first months or so back at adp germany wrote me an email um response to something i said and he said i'm really irritated about this and 
I walked to my boss. I'm like, what's, what's this guy's problem? Why is he mad at me for, you know, sending this email? And it took me quite a while. And I was kind of upset with this person. I didn't speak up. I probably should have, you know, Rachel, what you just said, just picked up the phone. What I didn't realize is that irritated means something else in German. And I'm a German speaker, but I, I forgot this. Irritated in Germany means confused, right? So he wasn't mad. He just didn't understand what I said. But I thought this guy was irritated in the sense that he could get mad at me for like, you know, asking this question. And it's only because he wrote the email. It's such a simple thing. And it can, you know, not asking questions, not picking up the phone, not seeking that personal connection. Um, they could have done some damage, right, in other, in other sense. Um, yeah, just a little anecdote, right? Yeah, that's that's a great example. I, um, I've, I've worked with people all, all over the world, and I always say that it's really important that if somebody says something to you as you're talking, like, make sure you clarify with them what mm-hmm. they mean, because it can be lost in translation. And Americans, I think, a lot of times are really bad at that. They just assume that whatever we say and do, that people all over the world just understand that terminology or that, you know, that meaning of something. And it's like, no, they don't. Um, And so, Mm -hmm. you know, just making sure that you're listening to people and, um, you know, asking a lot of questions and having that kind of dialogue. And, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think also for me personally, you miss a lot of that the body language when you're talking socially, you know, on social channels, because that's really important, especially for people who don't speak the same language. Yeah. No, I think uh, this has been such a, an amazing interview with you, Christian. Thank you for opening up your world to us. You know, I, I love the conversation. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I love the conversation and, and kind of the evolution that you've gone through. And I kind of want to just pick your brain before we end this call, because I want to be considerate of everybody's time. Um, you know, you've been involved in tech and family, and I know you and your wife are kind of mm-hmm. moving forward on that. Where do you see the future going with maybe the ease of technology and having that, that balanced work life and education? So very simple. And I, we, of course, I'm a little bit biased, of course, because I work for a, an RPA automation company, right? All we do is automate things, but it's, it's inevitable, right? That five, 10 years down the road, anything that is superfluous, mundane, or has nothing to do with idea creation or or kind of service communication will just be done by software bots, robots, software robots, whatever you want to call them. Um, And with, we see such a huge push, at least that is with the large corporations, you know, they have big digital labs where all they do is try to find ways to infuse AI into their programs, right? Just so that, um, uh, uh, there was a good example, you know, about, uh, about self-driving cars. You know, there was a lot of people being afraid of self-driving cars when they first hit the road, right? But the end of the day is a self-driving car, when it makes an, an accident, right? It typically only makes that accident once because then the computer program knows, aha, a right turn on this road when the light is green that was pretty uh, stupid because I ran into another car. Um, if I make the mistake as a human and 10 hours later, the same human drives on that road again, he doesn't know I made that mistake, right? So that human cannot learn from my mistakes indirectly, but computers can. Computers only make a mistake once. So we'll see um, an absolute heavy, heavy push um, 2021-22 on robotics, on AI, on anything that comes with like data optimization. And um, so that's why to close the loop, right? That's why we decided to, you know, to push our kids also and give them the tools for this because um, we believe that in 10 years, um, the way we teach will be completely eliminated, right? Classrooms are old fashioned and redundant. We don't need them anymore. Um, some traditional ways of, of working will be completely redundant and people need to, you know, embrace and let go of some of these things and really realize, you know, what they can be working towards. Um, and it's not data entry, right? As sad as it sounds, it's not, it's not testing manually a uh, software. It's not just like, it's not uh, pulling a lever on a, 
on a manufacturing line, those jobs will be gone, but they'll be replaced by new jobs, you know, more interesting jobs. Um, yeah, I hope that wasn't like too high level, but. Um, oh, that was beautiful. I think, I think yeah. necessity is the mother of innovation and we are at a period of time where we've been thrust fast forward by 15 years in most yeah. industries because of this pandemic. And yeah. pe people come from all walks of life. I mean, there will be some that, that need to hold on to the way that things were and that's fine. There will be companies that adapt, evolve and create and that's amazing. And I love that there's just so much opportunity because people have mm -hmm. the availability to be seen, to be heard and to learn. Like if they're jumping on and listening to this call right now and they didn't know that the world was so easy to, to like listen yeah. to some guy in the UK who's got just amazing experience. You know, they're seeing this and they're they're taking it in and their families are hearing about it at the dinner table. And it's just these thoughts provoke ideas, ideas provoke creativity, creativity, mm -hmm. new concepts and new development. And I just, I love that. So I want to continue to follow your journey, my friend. I want to watch it <laughs> and, and what you Same. do. Work. Um, you know, you guys should definitely check out Christian Reich on LinkedIn. Is there anywhere else you'd like them to follow you? Do you and your wife have a blog or anything you want us to put out there? Um, you know what? My wife is starting, I started a podcast, roguelearner.com. That is probably the best thing to check out. So listen to our podcast. Um, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And she also has a website, but LinkedIn is the best for me because that's where I spend most of my time. Awesome. You said roguelearner.com, right? Roguelearner.com. That is right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, Christian. Uh, Rachel, Jonathan, did you guys have any other questions for Christian before we let him go? Just thank you no, so much. No, just thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for, thanks oh, for thank you this, guys. Christian. Um, Good to meet you. That's, yeah, same, same. Let's stay connected. Yeah, yeah definitely. Sure. I'll send you a LinkedIn invite. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good deal. Thank Have you, a good Adam. day, you guys. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you again so much. Have a great day, everyone.